Amen. Good morning. You know, for uh, being in August, it's, it's not too bad, is it? We were out last night at Water Street, and we were really blessed. The weather wasn't too hot. We're so thankful for that. If you would stand with me as we read again from the scripture from Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. Mark chapter 6, as we study the life of Christ. Thank you for the music. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. And of course, the title, as you see in your bulletin, is Jesus Walks on the Water. Mark chapter 6, verses 45, says this. It says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side of Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against him. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, but immediately... He talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. And they had not understood, or for they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. And so there's a lot going on there, and we're going to be looking at that this morning as our Lord Jesus walks on water and he he deals with the disciples in the middle of a crisis and so let's pray and ask God to speak to our hearts this morning dear father thank you for bringing us out this morning dear God and Lord I, I just thank you for the privilege and the joy of sharing your word with your people and now Lord I pray that you'd help us to receive your word with fear with trembling O oh Lord for it is your word and I ask dear father that you would transform us and change us as we hear your truth Dear Father, we pray for that you would do a great work in our hearts and our minds. Lord, that you would cause us to love you more and to trust you more. Lord, that you would cause our hearts to be more contrite and to truly receive your word with a contrite heart. Lord, bless everyone who is here. And I pray, O oh Father, that there would not be one person that walks away without them knowing that God has spoken to their heart and to their mind. Bless us, we pray, we beseech you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As you know, we've been studying the life of Christ, and we've been just really studying the majesty of Jesus Christ and his authority. Christ, God Almighty in a bodily form. And we have seen the authority of Christ over disease. We have seen Jesus Christ, his authority over demons. We have seen Jesus, his, his authority even over creation. And even last week, we were, if you remember, we studied how Christ fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. It could have gone up to 25,000, which was miraculous. He took five loaves and two fish, and he began to multiply it. Probably this was the greatest miracle that, that impacted the largest amount of people at one time. And you find it in all four of the Gospels. And the lesson that Jesus was teaching his disciples as they are in training is that Christ is able to provide for their every need, their provision. And they needed to learn this lesson, but we learn, as we just read, that their hearts were hardened. And so we look at verses 45 to 52, and the Lord has another lesson for them, not just for them, but for us as well. And the lesson that Christ wants to teach his disciples is his divine protection. And I want you to understand this, beloved. If you know Christ and you have been redeemed, your day, the day of your birth has been already set in God's record and the day of your death as well. So really, you don't have to worry about it. You're in God's hands. And when the day of your departure comes, God has already set that date. 
But what we need to do in between the time of your birth and the time of your death is live for the glory of God. And so we learn here as Christ is here on the mountain on the east side of Galilee, we learn that he just fed the 5,000. And if you read John chapter 6, after Jesus performed this miracle, we learned that many of the people were talking about it and they wanted to make Jesus their king. They said, oh, this must be the prophet, the Messiah. But what they wanted, beloved, was not, not a Messiah or a savior that will save them from their sin, but rather they want someone to feed them all the time. They wanted some type of welfare. And they wanted this king also to deliver them from the Roman government. And Jesus was not a part of that. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners and to call the lost, to save the lost and call sinners to repentance. And that's where Israel didn't understand. They didn't understand the purpose of the Messiah. It wasn't just a political or to just deliver them politically, but first they needed to get their hearts right with God. And so we find the Lord Jesus performing this miracle, feeding them, feeding the 5,000, just like God fed the multitudes, 2 million people in the wilderness. Again, the sign that Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that after him will come a prophet like him. Ultimately, the fulfillment through Jesus Christ. So I want you to look at this here as we study how the Lord is the one who is our protector. He not only provides for us, but he protects us. And so let me just give you the outline here. In verses 45 to 46, we're going to see, we're going to see how the Lord, um, uh, his timing, the way he deals with his disciples, the way he, uh, his time with the Father. Number two, we see how he treads on water, verses 47 to 48. And then finally, 49 to 50, we see how the disciples are in deep trouble. And there's a very... There's a very powerful purpose behind this. Jesus needed to teach his disciples. Not only does he have authority over disease, authority over creation, but they needed to fully comprehend who Jesus is. He is God Almighty in a bodily form. They needed to understand that he is their Savior. Not just Savior from physical, uh, in the physical realm, but he is their Savior and Lord for all eternity. They needed to get this. So they are going through another lesson of faith. So let's look at the first part here. Let's look at his time with the Father. This kind of dovetails with our morning, uh, with our, uh, our morning uh, lesson. It says here in verse 45 to 46, it says, Immediately, as Mark likes to use, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, which is interesting. Jesus didn't give his disciples an option and say, hey, you know, let me give you a suggestion, guys. Go to the other side. He said, guys, you need to get out of here. And the reason why is because the people wanted to take Jesus by force and make him their king. They said, this must be the Messiah. We're going to make him our king. He's going to set up his kingdom, and we're going to be a part of that. He's going to deliver us from Rome. And Jesus was here. Remember, Jesus came to die. He didn't want his disciples to get caught up in this fervent spirit of the people. And so he sent them away, his disciples. And that's what it says in verse 45. He sent them away. He made them go into the boat to go to the other side. He sent them away from, and then he sent the multitude away. And this is really important, verse 46. And when he had sent them away, what did he do? He went to the mountain to pray. You find that many times Jesus went off by himself to pray to the Father. You know, Jesus was not only 100% God, but he's also 100% man. And I told you that Christ submitted himself completely to the Father. And there are times where Jesus just needed strength. He needed the Father to strengthen him and to be with him. Go with me to Mark chapter 1, would you? Go back with me. Remember, we saw this already. That when Jesus is about to do something, he spends a lot of time with the Father. 
In Mark chapter 1, look at verses 32 to 36. Remember the time that he healed Peter's mother-in-law? And we learned that, that after he did that, we learned that when the, uh, when the Sabbath was over, everybody, we learned that the whole town of Capernaum was at the doorstep of Peter. And we learned that, the, uh, that Jesus was healing them, remember, and casting out demons. Look at verse um, 32. At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. I can't imagine how many people there were. And we learned that Jesus touched every one of them. And the whole city was gathered together at, uh, at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, I want you to hone in on this. In the morning, having risen long while before daylight, what did he do? He went out, departed to a solitary place. And what did he do? And he prayed. Jesus needed to spend time in prayer. Beloved, I want you to understand this. Spending time with the Lord in prayer is spending time where you are strengthened in your spirit. The reason why you and I are not strong in the Lord and the reason why we're not, our lives are not being transformed the way they ought to be transformed is because we're not spending enough time with God. We spend so much time in front of the computer, in front of the television, and doing other things. We're so caught up in everything else. But the reason why we are not more like God is because we are not spending time with God. You know, if I want my son to be like me, he needs to spend time with me. And, and, and let me tell you, when I look at my son or my daughter, sometimes they're too much like me. <laughs> I like to tell them, sit down, guys. But the more time you spend with somebody, the more you're going to be like him. The more time you spend with the Lord, the more you'll be with like the Lord. The closer you, you get to the fire, the hotter it's going to get, isn't it? We need to spend time with God. If Jesus Christ himself needed to be strengthened by God the Father, how much more do we need to spend time with God? But we don't do it. Beloved, please understand how important this is. And so the very first thing that we look at here is the Lord Jesus needed time alone with the Father. And I, I bet he was praying for his disciples. I, you know, we don't know exactly what he was praying for, but I bet he was praying for them. We saw in John 17, the high priestly prayer, where he was always praying for his disciples. But, you know, there are certain Psalters that I look to that help me personally. There are times where I could read the Bible and it gets a little bit dry. And there are times where I can pray and I just feel so far from God. And, and there's a perspective in the Psalters of Psalm 42 and Psalm 63. This helps me to get perspective. Go with me to Psalm 42, would you? Keep your finger on Mark 6. Go to Psalm 42. In Psalm 42, I am always reminded... This is how I need to desire God. And you guys know there's a great song written from this. It is believed that the Hebrews were <clears throat> being taken to exile. This is the contemplation from the sons of Korah. Somehow they were away from the temple. And it says here, and you know this, this chapter, it says, As a deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul for you, O God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. With the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude, they kept a pilgrim's feast. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of my countenance. You see, this person that wrote this Psalter is, is longing to be again in, in the worship 
uh, procession to be there and to worship God. He says, I'm like a deer. I'm just so thirsty. Lord, I want to be in your presence. I want to be there with the throngs. I want to be worshiping you. And my beloved, this reminds me, this helps me of how you and I need to hunger and thirst for God. I mean, think about that. Ask yourself, do I really thirst for God? Do I really have this hunger for God? And if we don't, we need to ask God, God, would you give me this thirst? I want to thirst for you, Lord. I want to desire you. I look at this and I say, Lord, will you make this reality in my life? That I will long for you, that I will thirst for you? Go with me to Psalm 63, would you? And again, we see the Psalm of David while he was in the wilderness of Judah. Some believe it was during the time that he was being exiled, where he was fleeing from Absalom. Others believe there was a time he was fleeing from Saul. We don't know. I can just tell you this. He longed to be at the temple. And listen to what it says. He says, oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you, or earnestly. My soul what? Thirst for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have sought for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. When was the last time you hungered and you thirst for God? We need to have a hunger and a thirst for Him. And if you don't have that, ask God for it. He will give it to you. We need to have a hunger and a thirst for His Word. But you know, we're so busy with everything else, right? And I, I have to confess, I, I, when I get home, I, I want to find out what's going on in the news, you know? When I should open the Scripture and I should long for the Scripture... May God help us to hunger, to thirst, to long for the Lord. That's what God wants from us. This is the right perspective. And I know that God, uh, God the Son, desired to be with God the Father. And he spent those long hours, those long hours with the Father. Do you remember the last time you just had a long talk with God? Not just a little prayer, Lord bless us food, amen, type of thing. We're talking about a long conversation with God. When was the last time you had a long talk with God? Where you had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God? Where you shared with God what's on your heart, what's on your mind, what bothers you, what breaks your heart, what you long for, what your fears are? When was the last time you just poured out your heart to God? He's there. And he listens. But we're so caught up in everything else, aren't we? What does Matthew 6 say? Go with me there. Matthew 6 says we need to go into our private place. I mean, it's nice that we're here. We're in church. Praise the Lord. But we need time alone with God. Go with me in Matthew 6. Let me grab something real quick. Matthew 6. Look at verse 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus writes, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Or should I say to you, they have the reward. That's all they're going to get. But you, when you pray, what are we supposed to do? Go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Jesus Calls us to spend time alone with God, just between you and God. 
quiet time. So let me ask you this. How is your quiet time with God? The reason why, beloved, we don't have the peace that we should have, the reason why we don't have the strength that we should have is because we are not spending time with God. Oh, I encourage you, test my words. Spend time with God. Have a long talk with God. Let me tell you something. It's going to make a change in your whole attitude. It's going to change your character as you spend time with God. The famous song, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Right? It says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the voice I hear falling on my ears, the son of God. Is calling. Are you spending that time with God? I think some of the best time is in the morning. But if some of you are night owls, I mean, it's time to spend with God. Let me tell you something. When you pour out your heart with God, there's a change. You know, you can tell me all your problems, but I can't help you. I mean, I can give you some biblical counseling. But you talk to God, He can change everything. He can do the impossible. We need to close that door, don't we? Close that door, lock that door, and just tell your wife or kids, look, I'm going to be praying, guys. I need you to. I'm going to close this door, and I need to spend time with God. Pour your heart to God. He will bless you. We need time with him. And our Lord Jesus is such an example to us to spend time with God. Don't give God your leftovers, beloved. Give him your best time. May God help us to hunger, to thirst. And Jesus was praying. Go back with me to Mark. Jesus went up to the mountain. He was praying and probably praying for his disciples. We know that there are different times that Jesus prayed. We saw that he was praying there at Capernaum after he healed all those folks. We see here where he was praying. We also see Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane vital times of his life and we learn that the Lord was strengthened but let's look at verses 47 to 48 we learn that during this time after he fed the 5,000 and you know it was towards the evening he sent his disciples away remember that he said you guys got to get out of here because these people are you know this movement trying to do something and he sent them away And it says here in verse 47, Now when evening came, Jesus, remember, was up in the mountain. The boat was in the middle of the sea. They should have been across already, the Sea of Galilee. But instead, a storm came upon them. And it says that Jesus himself was alone on the land. Verse 48, And he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. I want you to understand something. Jesus is in the, on the mountain, right? We don't know how far inland he is. And there's a storm. And it is night. How did Jesus see them four miles out? That's part of his omniscience. I couldn't see in the darkness and there's a storm. There's no way I could see Jesus knew that they were struggling. They are going through a personal crisis. And here's the problem. Jesus wasn't in the boat with them. So they're like, oh no. What a mistake. Because last time Jesus delivered them out of the storm. That was so great. Remember that? He says, peace, be still. And like, boom. And then they all stood up at the end of the boat. Who is this guy? This time Jesus wasn't with them. And you know where the fourth watch is? That's between 3 o'clock to 6 a.m. in the morning. They had been rowing all night long fighting the storm. And I bet that most of them thought maybe today we're going to die. They've been fighting the storm all day long. 
But you know what, beloved? They had to go through this. The Lord allows us to go through storms in our life that our faith may grow. And Jesus was teaching them a lesson. He purposely did not go with them. He purposely allowed them to struggle all night long. They got to the point where they just thought, man, we don't get help soon. We're, we're going to perish. And we, it says here, the Lord could see them. And I really believe it was part of his omniscience. He can see them, that they were struggling, that they were in a crisis. And so the Lord comes to them. This is amazing. They had to learn something, beloved. First of all, they had to learn that the Lord is not only their provider, he is their protector. And so Jesus sees them. And it says in verse, go with me to verse 47, 48. He saw them straining at the rowing, for the wind was against them. Now the fourth watch between six, uh, 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. of the night, he came to them. What was he doing? Walking on the sea. And it says that he would have passed them by, and that's, you know, that's kind of a strained um, translation because when you look at uh, Abbott and Smith in the, in, the, in the Greek lexicon, it could also mean to come alongside of them. And I, I think that's more accurate. He wanted to come alongside of them. Because Jesus went on the water on purpose to go right to them. He could have calmed the storm from the land, but he wanted to come to them. He wanted them to see him coming. And when they saw him coming, they didn't recognize him. So instead, they were like, it's kind of funny because it says that they screeched. And the only way, the only time he uses that is when the, the demons were being cast out, they screeched. These people really were scared out of their skulls. They thought it was a ghost. I mean, they were exhausted. Think about this. All night long, this may be the day where they're going to die, and here comes Jesus. Beloved, I want you to understand that the Lord uses times in our lives, sometimes the times in our lives where we're the most afraid, or the times in our lives where we are the most humbled, where we hit the bottom of the barrel, and it is in those times that God uses to mold us. And God was allowing them to go through this, through this storm, straining, fighting the wind all night long. And then he comes to them. He wants to show them that he's with them. And I want you to understand that if you know the Lord, he is your protector. He will guide you. Go with me to Psalm 139, would you? You know, there is nothing that's hidden from God that you go through. What you and I need to understand, and what's going to give you and I comfort, and I've told you this, and I'll tell you this a million times, you must believe in the sovereignty of God, that the Lord is on the throne, that he is in control. Even though you don't see him, He's still in control. Psalm 139 talks about the omnipresence of God. What did I mean by that? It means he's everywhere. And it says in Psalm 139, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And listen to this. And are acquainted with some of my ways. Is that what it says? God knows everything about you. He knows when you lie down, when you sit up, when you're walking, when you're talking. He knows what your thoughts are. God knows. In fact, let me tell you, for a non-believer, this is scary. If you don't know the Lord, this is scary. If you know the Lord, this is comforting. <laughs> we can't hide our sin from God. God scrutinizes our path. He's acquainted with all our ways. 
And he says in verse 4, For there is not a word in my, in my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain it. Now verse 7 here talks about fleeing from God's presence. Where can I go from your spirit? What's the answer to that? Nowhere. There is nowhere that you can hide from God. For a non-believer, that's frightening. For those who are redeemed, that's a comfort. The disciples were in the middle of the ocean. They were in darkness. They were fearful of drowning. Guess what? The Lord is with them. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I send them to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide you. But the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Can't hide from the Lord. And though these men felt alone and they were by themselves and Jesus wasn't there in the boat, Jesus was still there. Didn't he say that? And in the Great Commission, go ye into all the world, right? And make disciples, teaching them all that I command you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always. If you know the Lord, he is with you. Always. Always. And you can talk to him. He's with you. And these disciples needed to learn this lesson. They needed to learn that Christ can see them and he is with them. And Jesus himself even gives them a picture himself by walking on the water to them. This is amazing. I mean, what an amazing thing to see, you know. And out of the, the darkness and out of the wind and the storm, you see this figure coming to you. And they became afraid. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, you know that, that the Lord watches over us so closely. He says, even the hairs on your head are what? Now, that's an amazing statement. I don't know too many people that know the number of hairs on their head. But God takes the time, I mean, to show you how God is so meticulous, so fastidious, so, you know, in details and the minutia in our lives that he takes the time even to count the number of hairs in our head. That's talking about his care. And it says that in Matthew, that even the hairs on our head are numbered. Beloved, what I'm trying to share with you is there's no reason if you know Christ as your Savior to be afraid of anything. The only one that you should fear is God. What can man do to you? What's the worst thing that can possibly happen to you and I? Oh, they kill me. I go to heaven, I'm with the Lord. To live is Christ, to die is gain. That's the worst thing that can happen to me. To me, that's the best thing. So really, what is it for us to fear? Really, for a Christian, you know, he's going from one life to another life, right? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die, right? Though he may die, yet shall he live. Psalm 56, could you go with me there? In Psalm 56... The Psalter says, when I am afraid, what does he say? Psalm 56, there's even a song to that. He says in verse 3, well, let's start in verse 1. He says, Be merciful to me, O God, 
for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me almost high. Look at verse 3. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. You know, beloved, that's the time to trust God. Is there something that you fear? What is it that you fear the most? Have you talked to God about that? Have you had that long talk? Say, God, there's one thing I fear. It's this. I fear this. And when you let the Lord handle it, you realize that mountain turned into a molehill. And so David writes this, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. I will not lean on my own understanding of Psalm 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Beloved, God is on the throne. You can trust Him. I'll tell you what, I'll let you down because I'm flesh and blood. But God, you can bank on Him. You can trust Him. And if you are afraid, you need to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. In verse 4, he says, In God I will praise His word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day long they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me are for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps. When they lie in wait for my life, shall they escape by iniquity and in anger? Cast down the peoples, O God. You number my wanderings. You put my tears in your bottle. Isn't that amazing? God numbers your tears. I mean, talk about knowing us. You put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? They're recorded. When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God I will praise His word. In the Lord I will praise His word. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made you. Made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. You have not kept my feet from falling. Or that I may walk before God and the light of the living. What are you afraid of? The disciples, they were fearing for their lives. But you see, they needed to learn. They needed to learn to trust in the Lord. They needed to learn to trust in God. And so Jesus comes out to them. When was the last time you had a long talk with God about your fears? When was the last time you had a long talk with God about your insecurities, about your hopes and your dreams? Oh, we need to spend time with God. I mean, it's wonderful that you can tell your wife or your husband or your friends, but you need to talk to God. Because He's your Lord, and He wants you to talk to Him. Now go back with me to Mark chapter 6, would you? Let's wrap this up. The disciples were in the middle of the ocean all night long. Not ocean, but in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus comes to them, comes alongside of them. Verse 49, when they saw him walking in the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. And they cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, but immediately he, he talked with them and he said to them, Be of good cheer or be of courage. It is I, do not be afraid. I mean, this is like the fourth time you see this in this gospel. Or one of four times. Then he went up into the boat to them. And what happened immediately? The wind ceased. Not only that, they were at the shore. It was like quantum leap. Amazing. And he went to the boat. 
Um, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. For they had not understood as, as, uh, you know, as the Apostle Peter, as Mark recorded his words, they had not understood the loaves. And this is very strong, a very strong sentence here. Because their heart was hardened. Isn't that amazing? The disciples still weren't getting it. One man put it, they were blockheads. They weren't getting it. It wasn't penetrating them. But something happened in this storm that changed them. Go with me to Matthew 14. There's certain things missing here that I think Peter, being a modest man and didn't want to make the story about himself, he didn't mention the part where he walked on the water. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14, I want you to understand something happened here. The disciples are so exhausted... You can start in verse 22. They have been, they've been rowing all night long, thinking they had saw a, seen a ghost. That scared them. But as I mentioned to you before, that the Lord was using this, this crisis. He was using this time of, of, uh, of turmoil and tribulation because He wanted to strengthen their faith. He wanted them to trust Him, not only that He can provide for them, but He wanted His disciples to know that they can count on Him, that He would protect them. And we can still trust the Lord today. He is with us. Nothing's going to happen to us without the permission of God. Verse 49, excuse me, uh, verse 22, Matthew 14. This is the same episode, but you see a little more detail here. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain uh, by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Showing again, he's the Lord of creation. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. And immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. <coughs> now here's a part that you don't get out of Mark. And Peter answered him, said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you in the water. Why? Because these guys are scared out of their minds. They're like, I need to be with the Lord. So what does Jesus say? He says, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But just like us, he started looking at his circumstances. He started leaning on his own understanding, right? But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, say, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they had got into the boat, the wind ceased. <clears throat> now, verse 33, I want you to hone in on this. This is the first time where you see the disciples declaring and confessing Jesus as the Son of God. There's a change. Something happened in that storm. Something happened to these men, these disciples of Christ, when Jesus delivered them out of the storm. There was a change. Then those who were in the boat came, and what did they do? They worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. See, they weren't seeing things very clearly. Even though Jesus used them and they cast out demons and they, they, uh, <clears throat> they healed the sick, they were not completely getting it that Jesus Christ is God Almighty, the second person in the Trinity, Almighty God in the bodily form. They weren't getting it. 
But when they were delivered through the storm, they saw the care of the Lord and the protection of God. And you saw him lord over creation. They came to the rescue. Finally, they realized you must be the son of God. They confessed Jesus. They went, as one man put it, from confusion to confession. From fear to faith. Things were no longer confusing anymore. They finally got it. The veil was lifted. And there was a transformation with these men. Truly you are, truly are the Son of God. It is amazing. And we learned that the next day, that when they crossed the Sea of Galilee, really they didn't really make it across because of the storm. The crowds that were fed, that 5,000... They wanted to find Jesus again because they, they were hungry. It was breakfast time. Oh, hey, there he is. Hey, we're hungry again. Jesus says, you don't seek me because, you know, for the right reasons. You're seeking me because you want to fill your belly. You want to make me your king because you want to be fed all the time. Jesus said, look, that, that, that food is temporary. But the Son of Man gives his body as bread, right? It's a bread from heaven. And Jesus says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And a lot of his disciples at that time says they, they walked away from Jesus. Oh, that, that, that saying is too hard. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, will you leave also? Are you going to leave also? And, Jesus, and Peter said, remember, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. They were convinced, my friends. Something happened that night to the disciples of Christ. The veil was finally lifted. I mean, Jesus had been with them for two years now. And they worshipped him. Beloved, we've come to worship him, haven't we? But let me tell you something. We need to worship God every single day. Worship is just not what we do once a week. Worship should be a lifestyle. Your life should be an offering to the Lord. It should be an act of worship. That's what we ought to do. And you see this change. They finally, in a sense, they saw Jesus in a whole new light. Let me read to you a Psalter that my grandfather used to read to me or to my family before we took a trip. Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Before we took a long trip, my grandfather read this in Spanish. And it was always a very comforting psalter because it taught us that the Lord is always watching over us. To protect us. Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God is the one watching over you. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't have human limitations. But his eyes are upon you. You are his children. You're his babies. He's watching over you. We can talk to him day and night. And he's on the throne. Finally, let's close the psalm. Well, not close, but let's go to Psalm 91. We'll close in a second. Psalm 91. You guys know this Psalter. Psalm 91, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I trust. 
Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only your eyes shall, shall look and see the reward of the wicked. And here's God now. Uh, reason why God preserves you. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Now God speaks here in verse 14. And God says, because he has what? Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Do you realize that the evidence of a person that truly is born again is a person that loves God? It's someone who loves the Lord. And the Lord says, this person loves me. And this person knows me. And because he has set his love upon me, I will deliver him. I will deliver her. Because they have a relationship with him. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Isn't that a blessing? Is God your protector? You better believe it, friend. He's not only your savior from sin, your savior because, you know, from the wrath of God, but he's also your protector. Please understand that. God has not saved you and then abandoned you. You know, that's deism. That's not right. He is with you and he's, he's, he's concerned about the minutia in your life where he counts the number of hairs in your head. He's concerned about everything about your life. But you need to talk to him. Spend time with him. Share your heart with him. In closing, let me just say this and we need to get ready for the Lord's table. The disciples that seen Jesus, his authority, as I mentioned before, over demons, diseases, creation, over every circumstance, but now they see Jesus differently. They see him as a protector. They see him as a savior that truly cares for them and watches over them. It, you know, that changed them. It transformed them. So my question, beloved, is this. Do you see Jesus as your savior? As your deliverer? And I remember a young man said, well, well when Jesus saves you, saves us from what? What's the answer to that? What does Jesus save us from? From the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God is, abiding, is abiding upon those who do not believe in Christ. God's wrath abides upon them. John chapter 3, verse 36. So God's wrath is there. Jesus has come to save sinners. To deliver us from the wrath of God. So my question to you is, have you been delivered from the wrath of God? Have you trusted in Christ? You might say, well, pastor, I haven't done that. Well, the first step is admit that you are a sinner. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Admit that. Admit that you have sinned against Almighty God, against His perfection, because we all fall short of God's perfection. We fall short of God's holiness. We fall short of God's righteousness. We're all sinners. We need to admit that. And God is perfect and he's holy. And guess what? God is going to judge. We have all broken God's perfect law. And if we're sinners, guess what? What do sinners need? Sinners need a savior. Sinners need a savior. And that's what we need. We need to admit, first of all, I'm a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, I need a savior. I need someone to deliver me. I can't save myself. We need a Savior, and that's what Jesus does. He came to save, to seek and to save that which is lost. 
Every single sinner needs a Savior, and that's who Jesus is. That's why he came. So my question to you is, are you willing to trust in Jesus? Number one, are you willing to repent? Because Jesus calls us all to repentance. What do I mean by that? Are you willing to turn away from your sin? Are you willing to turn away from those, that, those things that displease God? For some young girls I was talking to last night at the water street, I said, you know, you need to stop living for yourself and start living for God. That's what repentance looks like. Because those young ladies were saying, well, I believe in Jesus. And I said, you know, that's great that you believe in Jesus because even the demons believe in Jesus, but they're not saved. So you have to go beyond the demons. You need to be willing to repent of your sin and trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. This is very important. But if you simply say, well, I believe in Jesus, I believe. Demons say the same thing. In fact, when Jesus was casting them out, they said, we know who you are. The Son of God. Yeah, they confessed him. Were they saved? No. So we have to make sure that we have trusted in Christ as our Savior, as our Lord, willing to repent. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Well, let's bow our heads. I think we have a song right now. And then we'll prepare our hearts for this morning's table. Lord, thank you for our time together. I thank you for your word. Father, what a lesson the disciples learned alone at night as they were panicked in a crisis, not knowing what to do. They didn't see Jesus there and and, and the Lord Jesus came to them to show them that he is there for them. That he is not just their provider, but he is their protector. And they saw Jesus in a whole different light. They worshiped him and they confessed that he truly is a son of God. Father, help us to confess that Jesus is a son of God. God in the flesh, our Savior, our Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing hardships in our lives that we may trust you. As much as we cannot stand them, Lord, and hurt in our flesh, yet, dear Father, the fire has come into our lives and, and it just molds us and makes us more into the image of Jesus to trust him. Lord, bless us now, dear Father, we pray and prepare our hearts for the communion. And we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. We pray.